Good evening to one and all. I am Anshala Mehta, Assistant Director at Impact and Policy Research Institute, IMFRI, New Delhi. And I welcome you all to episode 21 of our talk series, The State of Gender Equality, Hashtag Gender Gaps, organized by the Gender Impact Studies Center at IMFRI, along with GenDev Center for Research and Innovation and Delhi Post. Today, we have with us Professor Indrani Mazumdar giving a talk titled Under the Shadow of the Pandemic, Gender, Employment and Migration in 21st Century India. It's my pleasure to introduce her to you all. In July 2020, Professor Indrani Mazumdar retired as Senior Fellow at the Center for Women's Development Studies, New Delhi. Over the past two decades, her research focus has been on gender, labor and migration in India. Her book, Women, Workers, and Globaliza Globalization, Emergent Contradictions in India, published in 2007, includes studies of garment workers, electronics workers, home-based workers, and call center workers. Her other publications include Home-Based Workers in 21st Century India, Gender, Labor, and Women's Work, Issues, Experiences, and Debates in India, Social Transformation and Cultural Change in South Asia from the Perspectives of the Socioeconomic Periphery, Unfree Mobility, Adivasi Women's Migration, among many others. She co-edited the Review of Women's Studies on Gender, Labor and the Constitution in the Economic and Political Weekly EPW, 16th May 2020, which includes her article Crossroads and Boundaries, Labor Migration, Trafficking and Gender, written jointly with N. Neeta. She was General Secretary of Indian Association for Women's Studies from 2014 to 2017 and ex officio member of its executive committee to, from 2017 to 2020. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us today and taking out the time to share your insights on this theme. We also have with us Professor Govind Kelkar chairing the session. She is chairperson of the Gender Impact Study Center at IMPRI and executive, direct, executive director of Gender Center for Research and Innovation. I would now hand it over to her to make her initial remarks and then invite Professor Indrani Mazumdar to make her presentation. Over to you, Professor Kelkar. Okay. So very welcome, hmm? Indrani. I will also call you Indrani if I can tell <laughs> Professor Indrani Mazumdar. I have so got spoiled in calling, knowing each other for so long. So even in formal meetings like this, it becomes <laughs> difficult. Huh? to go into the formal names. I'm really delighted to uh, kind of that you accepted this um, um, talk amid all your busy schedules because I've been rearing and sometimes seeing you either in Orisa and earlier last year, of course, not <laughs> this year. So this is indeed very good. And I think you have also been doing with, uh, some work with Rosa Lagdumberg along with um, and along with some other colleagues. So. What uh, Anshula described is not all. You have, for decades, you have worked on labor, uh, women's work, migration, globalization. These have been really the main areas of your work. And we look forward to hearing you and then probably discuss it, and then I'll come later. Thank you, Indrani, and uh, over to you. Well, actually, uh, this seems to be quite a, uh, uh, a nice sort of conversation for all of us. And I'm not very sure how my formal presentation is going to work in this. But still, let me go ahead with it because otherwise I'm, one will tend to ramble and sort of go all over the place. Well, let me begin by saying that uh, to thanking Dr. Arjun Kumar and team Imfri for providing an opportunity for, uh, for me to present some of my thoughts on the pandemic, gender, employment, and migration. Um, I'm very happy that uh, Govind is in the chair because uh, we have uh, much understanding between us. And I think, Indra, you are going to be the discussant. Are you discussant? Uh-huh. Yes. Okay, so, and I'm really happy to have Indra here also. And, uh, I think sometimes the webinar allows us to meet, uh, format allows us to meet uh, when normal intercourse is otherwise quite difficult, doesn't work out always. So um, uh, let me just quickly go because uh, I think Arjun would like me to finish within half an hour. 
So let me just quickly go to some of the points that I wanted uh, to, to make. Right, ma'am, we also have Dr. Archana Sinha uh, as another discussion. Ma'am has al also joined. Sina. Okay, Archana Sinha, welcome. And I'm really happy that uh, somebody that I am not fully acquainted with is also going to be assessing what I'm saying. So that's, uh, having said that, let me quickly begin. Um, let me begin my arguments with a few general points that have been in discussion from the early days of the pandemic itself and lockdown in India. Uh, can you put the first slide? We'll just quickly run through these points. Uh, Ritika, right. Now, one, of course, is uh, the question of uh, poorly understood uh, differential impact of the disease itself on men and women and the need for sex disaggregated data, which is even today limited. And it's certainly not available in relation to the vaccines that are being touted with such great uh, seeing and where some people have actually commented of the, on the practice of science by press, press release, which is actually not giving us the, uh, the public, the data that is uh, being collected in relation to the vaccines also. The issue of domestic violence has come to the fore, the question of increased care burdens under lockdown conditions and uh, restricted movement, decreased access to necessary support, et cetera, et cetera, that is there in the slide. One factor is, uh, one issue is the issue of the uh, health workers. And the, since a large majority of the health workers are women, the question of burnout and in, uh, increased workload, inadequate protections, these have been discussed. Less discussed, and in fact, has hard, uh, the issues which have hardly made the headlines is the fact that these contingents of workers, major contingents of workers, frontline workers, are, remain unrecognized as workers. They remain disentitled from minimum wage and other basic rights as workers. As you know, ASHA workers are also considered, they are, their designation is of activist. Anganwadi workers are designated volunteers. And in that process, they are denied very basic minimum rights as workers. So that's also an issue that is there in missing. There are of course other inequalities. I won't, won't go into that fear and stigma-based discrimination, all of you would know what I'm referring to. But I want to actually focus a bit on the tendency to use uh, emergency powers, excessive use of emergency powers. And we have some lessons to learn from our history. So can we move to the next slide? Uh, this, I'm actually just uh, briefly touching on a historical parallel of an earlier pandemic, which uh, Indra, you would also be quite acquainted with the plague uh, uh, in, in, at the turn of the nine, end of the 19th century and early 20th century. And that was at that time we were under a colonial government and Bombay particularly, which was the epicenter, was gripped by a whole series of draconian measures. And uh, there, were a whole, there was a whole lot of political fallout in, uh, in that uh, context. Forms of resistance, Rajnar and Chandavarkar's uh, article on this chapter in this book has uh, discussed it in quite great detail. Now, he mentions the fact that there were forms of res various forms of resistance, but the most common response was, of course, flight. Uh, you know, huge numbers of workers fled the large towns and substantial, they just ran away. And this is quite familiar because we saw it here. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, but what was important is that the plague led to the enactment of the Epidemic Diseases Act, uh, which was one of the laws that was also invoked in the lockdown in March. Now, resistance to the plague regulations, which were very oppressive for the colonized populace in, our, in, in, in India, uh, apart from the fact that they didn't understand what was the cause of the plague, uh, but those regulations were very oppressive, led to a lot of resistance. And of course, I think people would know that Tilak was convicted of sedition because he wrote against the colonial government's practices in relation to the plague after the plague commissioner in Pune was assassinated. So such was the level of resistance and such was the 
colonial government. And uh, I, I'm sure all of you can see the parallels. Now, in, in the current moment, if the enormous exercise of force by the police in the, because the police have had a heyday during this period, uh, <laughs> is one of the uh, policy, is a, is a matter of concern as a policy response to the pandemic. It also needs to be noted that under the shadow of the pandemic, we have had railroaded through uh, uh, four labor codes, which are uh, against the wishes of all trade unions, including the BMS of the uh, supporting the BJP. Uh, we've, we've seen the ramming through of these uh, three of the four labor courts and, uh, uh, and the ramming through of the farm laws which against the wishes of, of the farmers. So we, you, you, you see within the whole uh, uh, pandemic uh, response, you see an enormous concentration of power and centralization of power and the uh, use of the state transforming it into a new kind of instrument of uh, uh, oppression also. And this is also there in the uh, recent decision to even uh, uh, bring in, everything is said is, bring, is being uh, brought in the name of reforms, but what the nature of these so-called reforms are, are sort of eroding all the democratic uh, elements that uh, exist in our systems. Okay, can we move to the next slide? Now you may ask, are these policy questions and historical experiences of relevance to women because we are discussing gender? Are they gender concerns at all? I would argue that they are. And uh, we, uh, my friend and colleague and women's studies scholar, Indu Agnihotri refers to the three Ds, repeatedly refers to the three Ds, diversity, development, democracy, as central to gender uh, concerns. And it's, if we do not uh, recognize these as cent central, then we are not going to be able to even look for a, uh, a process of the, the equalization, pro equalization process or even uh, push the agenda of equality. If we do not recognize the diversity, what are we going to be uh, uh, fighting on the equality front about? If we do not recognize what are the issues in development and we do not search for alternatives when they work against uh, the interests of equality and particularly in, uh, in the current uh, uh, period when inequality is touted as the way, mode of development, uh, then uh, where is the equality agenda? And democracy, of course, uh, essential without uh, a voice for women, we know that uh, the equality agenda for women is just rhetoric, words, nothing more. Now, having said that, let me say that uh, there has been some discussion that it is often said that the pandemic uh, has brought out uh, the fault lines of Indian society and the discourse on the, on, but the discourse, the issue is, but discourse on gender under this thing has typically followed along the framework set by SDGs and international debates. It's not rooted on, in the, on, on our own ground in a certain sense. At least this is the feeling that I get that when one hears all the public discussion, SDG, this, that, and the other. This is what is the frame in which everybody talks and not less uh, references made to our own grounding. And we don't seem to have our own feet, our feet on our own ground when we think about these questions. Uh, yeah, okay, domestic violence, some of the issues correctly brought out and I'm not going to go into all that. But what I, I mean, one thing that is of course striking is as uh, Arjun also mentioned, the story of the pandemic in, uh, in India is the story of this huge out-migration of uh, workers from uh, particular various urban centers fleeing to their homes. Now, I don't want to reiterate what everybody knows, their conditions and so on and so forth. But the fact is that migrant workers did enter the space of public uh, uh, discussion in, in this period in a way that they have never managed to have this such a space earlier on. This was basically. And yet, 
notwithstanding their visibility, the visibility of women among these migrants, the gender dimensions of the migrant question and the special conditions of women's labor migration have remained ignored and sidelined in all the public policy debates, including, let me say, including these uh, very many my, uh, organizations that have genuinely been working for migrant workers and have tried to raise the question of migrant workers for many years and they really pushed their issues even in during the pandemic. But they just didn't look at gender and they just didn't uh, acknowledge that there are certain uh, special conditions. Now I thought, can we move to the next slide? I thought that uh, I would take for uh, to put to initiate a discussion on these questions, I would take uh, some of the uh, two of the most uh, well publicized cases uh, in, uh, of uh, of uh, around women migrants that have uh, definitely hit the public eye and think about it together. And all of you, I would like all your views on this. Now, the first case is of a 13-year-old Adivasi girl, Jamlo Magdam, who many of you would know, died during her journey on foot, on re returning to Chhattisgarh from, to her uh, village, Aded in uh, Bijapur, Chhattisgarh, from uh, the chili fields in Telangana. Now, everybody was shocked and there was a law. everybody felt that this young girl <coughs> how she must have suffered on the journey and how uh, she died and and there was a, a a huge outcry about it but there was no discussion on the about the phenomena of these all female groups of women migrating for agricultural uh, operations particularly commercial agriculture like chili production uh, and what, I mean, why, how, why and how uh, was this uh, girl recruited uh, as part of this group of 11 from a village called Adel, which barely comprises uh, 37 households, Adivasi dominated village with only six literates in its uh, female population and uh, located in the interior of a sparsely populated, uh, populated forest land. That's one question. How is this labor market in rural areas? How is this migration pattern being established? And what are the modes in which this uh, is working is a question which is not being discussed. Secondly, why did the labor officer in uh, Bijapur not use the Interstate Migrant Workmen's Act, which was still there because the labor codes had not yet come in at that time? I mean, at least that. Um, occupational safety uh, code had not been passed by then. So this, uh, this law was still on the statutes, uh, statutes. That was not used. But instead, what was used? After this girl died, he registered a case of under the anti-trafficking section of 370 against that women, woman agent from Jamlo's village who had now she was what she was paid ten thousand rupees to take eleven uh, people to that place uh, from there. They would have paid for bus, for food, all that, etc. Now ten thousand rupees is not a huge amount of money, and uh, uh, obviously this woman was herself a worker because she was working there and she returned with them there. So she was also caught in the lockdown there, and she returned with them. Where listen, no, she may have been unkind. To Jamlo. She may have been, what, her name was Sunita Magam. She may have not treated her very nicely. But is she a trafficker? Is there an organized crime network? And I raise this question because this is the typical way in which women's migra labor migration is viewed, you know, in this thing. That if, if women are uh, migrating, then the trafficking lens and the trafficking perspective sort of kicks in in a particular way, which doesn't address their basic questions, doesn't address their wages, doesn't address their employment issues, but 
uh, locks them into a particular framework. And now, and uh, we can discuss this later, but you see there has been, a, 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 there is a, an increasing attempt to bring draconian anti-trafficking provisions, which are really targeting young women migrants, sending, you know, informers and police sort of to surveil them everywhere. It's, it's a very uh, restrictive and, uh, and it fits into the ideology that if women are migrating for work, then there's a sexual component, it sexualizes everything. And this whole framework, so the actual lives of the, uh, or the actual conditions are not addressed, but this whole uh, tam jam around this whole question is locked into this trafficking. The police play the main role and obviously none of their worker, working conditions are addressed. That's one thing that I mean. Can we move to the next slide? The second case I wanted to discuss was that of the, the death of uh, Arvina Khatun. Now, all of you would have seen that uh, horrible uh, pic uh, picture of this 15 month old toddler Rahmat trying to wake his dead mother on the Muzaffar Nagar platform. Now, it shocked everybody and I think it deeply disturbed many people who, when, when they saw it. But uh, the question is, a question that I would actually like to uh, raise around that thing is, it was reported that Arvina had been married. She's from Katihar, which uh, is one of the most uh, uh, backward districts in the country. And uh, one of the 11, which are, have Muslim concentration. Um, how was it that Arvina was married from Katihar to, to a man in Bareilly, a thousand miles, more than a thousand miles away from her own uh, home village in a cultural zone, which is quite different from that of uh, uh, her home, uh, her own natal village and natal uh, social, sociocultural milieu. How did that happen? Now it is known uh, when I, I looked into it and I saw that Azam Nagar block where her village is located has been, there have been reports of what is called the sale of these uh, brides to uh, uh, other uh, long distance cross regional uh, uh, marriages. They call it the sale of rights. Now, whether it is sale or not, I'm not going into that. But the question is that there is a process that has uh, um, sort of un underlying this, uh, this phenomenon of cross-regional marriage, which is against the norms of uh, normal uh, marriage uh, uh, boundaries, etc. And uh, in this case, it was she's divorced and she comes back, of course. But the question still remains, why? Nobody asked. So many reporters covered it, but there, nobody was asking this question as to how is it that she married so far away? What was there? Her mother said was it, the marriage was arranged with, through a broker. But anyway, that's a question because the que issue of cross-regional marriage and the reasons why this cross-regional marriages are taking place and the role of women's labor in this in cross-regional marriages are questions that we are particularly interested in. And we can discuss that in detail later on. But related to that is the two other points. Now this region, you know, there's a sizable number of Muslim women uh, who uh, are part of the construction, migrant construction labor force from this region, Katihar, Purnia, uh, Araria, et cetera. This particular area of Bihar, you see a sizable number of uh, women, um, uh, Muslim women in the construction workers workforce. And you'll see them in Delhi also. Some of them have moved to domestic work, et cetera. But the question is that there is this phenomenon. So the image of the Muslim woman is and they don't wear burqa, they're a different cultural uh, uh, location. Uh, that is one point I wanted to just highlight. But more importantly, what I wanted to really stress was the fact is that how is it that Arvina, why, why was she going back? Now here we, we are faced with the new, the situation. Construction industry, which has been booming for a month around uh, 
two and a half decades, and even though it's slightly slowed down, but it's still doing pretty well. And the main thing is construction has become highly corporatized on the capital side. And this is most evident in Gujarat, where these uh, 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 Arvina and her children uh, had gone for to work. Now, how is it and why is it that this highly corporatized industry does not maintain a single worker on its roles. And all the work, its entire workforce is actually um, uh, uh, casual labor. This is persisted and uh, um, uh, it is allowed to do so. It, uh, only engineers are employees of construction companies. Workers are all casual uh, uh, and uh, brought in on contract to be used when they are required and thrown out when they are not required. And this, my view, is, is a big question for us today when construction has emerged as the second largest uh, 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 um, uh, employer uh, after agriculture, which is not, it's a, it's a very, uh, 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 a poor situation that we are staring ahead of us. And Arvina, with her children, she is also there. Of course, the, her conditions of work, that is not sort of being discussed. But the main thing is that she obviously, because she's a casual worker, she doesn't get any, uh, there's no possibility of her being paid for that interim period. And so she had to return and that what led to her death. Now, these are questions which I believe are important questions. And the fact that her children have, uh, her family has received some compensation, they're not settled by that because the issue is that these questions affect hundreds and thousands of women and they remain unaddressed and just uh, having some compensation for children of this dead arena this is not uh, an adequate uh, response okay so then can we move to the next slide i think i'm really running out of time am i going very uh, uh, anyway the third aspect i wanted to that has that i i had read about was the uh, this uh, mm, these migrant uh, textile work, uh, garment workers. And the big incident is of course, uh, from a, uh, uh, apart from the, I'm not going into the, how labor laws were suspended and so on and so forth, because that's pretty universal. But the big story in here was this big company, the largest garment uh, export company in Kerala, uh, in the Kochi district, uh, <laughs> where, Hundreds of uh, garment workers just fled back to their village. Now, 600 went back to Jharkhand and 150, after that, 150 just resigned and returned to Orissa. Now, who are these girls? It's important for us to understand. Um, these are the girls, they, are, they lived in the hostels there. They are migrants. This has been a trend for the last, let us say, 15 years. This has become quite... Uh, established and uh, the modus operandi which is driving this particular phenomenon is the skill development programs that the government is uh, undertaking. Now we can discuss uh, the nature of those skill development programs but my point is I've looked at the whole structure and it's a, a completely privatized model of training fully government funded privatized delivery and uh, including training and placement. And so we have the development of a new nexus, which is that the government is subsidizing, subsidizing this new or paying for this new uh, nexus, which is again, quite a common uh, uh, phenomenon in the current uh, day. But, and of course we know that uh, 50, only 15% of all these skilled trainees actually get placed. It's not solving the employment problem, et cetera. All that is there, we're not ever seeing. But the question is, they are being trained and placed in highly onerous and oppressive conditions where their freedoms are being lost. And this is where you have this whole contradictory policy approach towards uh, women's migration. On the one side, you have this trafficking discourse. On the other side, you have skill development and promoting interstate. They're sent out of the state. Orissa and Jharkhand are very important in this particular thing. And they lose their freedoms in that whole process. Okay, can we move? I'll, I'll just quickly want to ask. Now, 
I want to, uh, I mean, these are some of the questions which I've brought in from the experience of, uh, 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 experiential questions from uh, or around migration in the condition of the, of the pandemic. But the issues are of course, obviously much broader. There's data also, data issues, but I'm not going into that just now because I won't be able to cover the ground. The real point that I want to make at this point is that it's important for us to understand that the, there is an in, enormous crisis in employment and it has been a gendered uh, employment crisis now for some 15 years. And now that people are talking about the employment crisis, we, it's, it's difficult to uh, separate the gender issues at this point because everybody is facing an employment crisis. But uh, this, uh, the highly gendered crisis has, has been ferociously attacking uh, rural women's work for, I mean, it, it, it's quite incredible. And I just, let's just, uh, and I, I, I feel very bad that we, some of us have been talking about it. And very frankly, I have to say that we were not believed. And one of the reasons we were not believed is uh, because legitimately women's studies has long argued that uh, a lot of women's work is invisible and it's not counted. There's no doubt that that is true. Even today, even today it is despite the fact that there have been certain changes, certain improvements, all that is there. Uh, despite all that, the fact is that there is a lot of invisible work that women do in various ways. Uh, let's see, uh, in, in various kinds of uh, work. But when we are dealing with the employment data that is uh, provided by earlier the NSSO, now the NSO, whatever it is, but anyway, when we're dealing with workforce participation for what is called the production boundary. Now, what we have seen in this recent years is a large scale eviction of women from that production boundary, including paid and unpaid work, because they're not all paid in that. Uh, this thing. Okay, can we move to the next slide, Ritiku? Yeah, so here we have, uh, this is, uh, uh, as you can see, um, uh, uh, the, I don't know whether you can see up to how far it has grown, but you can see the main fall is in rural areas, the blue line, and uh, the, the, as far as urban areas are concerned, there it has been mainly stagnant with a slight fall. That this thing, I think I don't need to explain this. Can we move to the next slide? Now, I thought people would be interested in sort of looking at what was the experience across some of the states. And here you can see um, what I'd like to really highlight is look at Bihar. It's dropped to rural Bihar, it's 2.6%. Is it not? I mean, it made sounds incredible. And yes, of course, there is undercounting and all this. But I mean, just can you imagine the scale of the crisis that women in Bihar are facing? And please remember Arvina's uh, situation uh, with, uh, in, in, in such a context. Uh, <coughs> but anyway, let's quickly move to the, uh, the... Now here I want to point out that there has been uh, uh, this fall in uh, work participation, that is a fall in employment rates. And I should mention that between uh, 2005 and 2018, 19, uh, close to 50 million women have been evicted from this workforce. It's not just a, a fall in, in rates because sometimes rates will uh, uh, fall, but absolute numbers, there may be an increase because population increase takes place. But this is an absolute fall that has taken place. And the nature of the fall you can see here because here you uh, see it's by social group. You can see that the maximum fall is amongst scheduled tribes. And Indra, I'm sure you'll be interested in that. This scheduled, the tribals have seen the maximum fall followed in, and I, this is referring to rural India, followed by scheduled castes, followed by OBCs, and, for, and then top of the least for the 
upper castes. Now, it's like a reverse pyramid. In rural areas, all communities, all sections have lost, uh, have uh, fallen. Their work participation rates have fallen, uh, women's. But um, this table, I should explain a bit. Uh, the first, uh, up to 2011-12, I have used Nita's figures. And Nita had uh, separated Muslims from OBC and upper caste. So these figures are given separately for them. But for 2018-19, I have used only the published data, not the uh, unit level. I've not done any unit level. So this does not, uh, uh, is not, uh, you cannot exclude uh, Muslims. So Muslims are included in OBC and upper castes as well, because they're not there in the other two categories. <laughs> so as you can see, it's a reverse pyramid. So the worst affected, and these are, yeah, are in a sense, a proxy for the most marginalized and uh, poorest sections. They are the worst affected in rural areas. It is important for us to note this, as I, I thought. Let's go, just go to the urban. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in urban areas, what it, what is very interesting is, because, you know, as it's, you know, it's stagnant, and there's been a slight fall when you take it uh, across the two decades. But upper castes, upper castes have, they have in fact actually seen a slight increase in work participation rate. Now, uh, all of us know that the ideologies of confinement and restrictions on females work have, have been driven by upper caste ideologies in our societies. And, uh, here we are seeing that there is a change taking place when it comes to their own women. There is a certain degree of change. That's why it's appeared. It's at least appearing in the statistics. Otherwise, you know, it would be too small. It's not so small that it's not appearing. It's appearing in the statistics. And we do know that as of now, uh, in higher education, uh, women have uh, achieved all a virtual parity and certainly the, their proportion in the population is reflected in their proportion in higher education. Now, this is a big change that has taken place uh, over the last uh, two decades. So in higher education, women have achieved uh, almost uh, parity in enrollment and things are changing in on, on various things. There, there are problem still, but there, it's, it's on the uh, trajectory of change. <laughs> so upper castes, upper caste ideology and upper caste uh, uh, notions and approaches towards women appear to be slightly changing. So it's not enough for us to refer to uh, gender ideology and restrictive cultures as the primary reason for women's uh, falling work participation rates. It's not the case. As you can see, this is, I just wanted to, let's, let me, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, these last two slides, I think I'll stop at this point because um, I think I've uh, done my half an hour. Uh-huh. What are you doing? Ma'am, yeah? you can finish, no problem. Ma'am, you can no. take a couple of more minutes and finish, no problem. Since we are having a discussion amongst our friends, I'd really like to say that we've really missed the bus on this employment question, very frankly. We really quite missed the bus. We had an opportunity 10 years ago to put the whole question of all the gender issues uh, related to employment and our in, uh, inequalities by pushing the employment question to the foreground, to the forefront. Not having done that, now we will be alongside others, etc. That is now. I'd like to only say, conclude by saying one thing: that um, having said, made this minor criticism, which you, I'm sure you hope uh, you will all understand. It is meant in um, in a in the sense of. Uh, comradeship and uh, solidarity amongst ourselves. But the, uh, uh, it's important for us to also recognize that the signs of change on the ground and the signs of a new assertion amongst women are also pretty apparent. And let me say that uh, 
Of course, in the farmers' agitation, they are there. You know, they're not much in focus, but they are very much there. And uh, Navsharan Singh, who has been studying Punjab, has referred to the fact that uh, uh, Dalit women, agricultural laborer women, have over a period of time really been struggling on several issues, and that has fed into their uh, uni un uniting with the rest of the farmers in this particular um, uh, agitation that is currently ongoing. But uh, I'd like to say that the same, in, 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 if you look at the trade union movement, and here I really want to discuss some questions amongst our own friends. Um, you know, in the 1970s, we, uh, there was a, a 80s particularly, there was a lot of talk about the fact that the all female uh, trade union and particularly SEVA um, uh, emerged as the representative of this new assertion and this new uh, looking at women's uh, work, women workers, looking at the fact that they were in informal, predominantly in informal work, that their conditions were so bad. And it was seen as the seva is the vehicle for raising this. Uh, it, it, it aroused a lot of, um, what, what can one say? It, people were inspired by this model and this whole understanding. But what has happened over the last uh, two or three decades, you actually see that uh, women, um, women's share of trade union membership has been consistently rising. It is currently 32%. Now, do you know what women's share in the workforce is? Overall, it is around 22%. But if you separate paid workers, because this includes unpaid workers also, if you separate the pay, paid workers are 16% of the workforce. Yeah, 16%. And, and in 2000, in the year 2000, in trade union membership, women were only uh, 16, around 16%. Now they are 32%. And in between, they went up to 37 and 38%. Now, the trade union statistics are very poor. They're poorly collected. And so on. But what is interesting is that in Kerala, for example, the female membership of trade unions is now more than half. It's 54%. I've not seen anybody commenting on this. But you can see on the streets, you can see in all the uh, workers' struggles that women have emerged, they have acquired a leadership. And strangely, this leadership has grown in all female workforces, in all female, the Anganwadi workers, the Asha workers, where all women, uh, the whole uh, workforce is, is all female. Out of that, you have a dynamic leadership, which has, you know, really <laughs> sort of stimulated the trade union movement as uh, a, a, in a time where there was a certain degree of ossification that was visible in, in, in the union. The women have injected this dynamism, but the all female workforces have chosen the mixed gender unions as their vehicle for their, as the vehicle for their voice. Now, this is a particularly interesting phenomenon because the all-female trade union is not uh, obviously reflecting their needs in this particular situation. And here, I would like to end by just saying that it's my, in my view, the discourse around informal, informal sector has uh, had its day. And we need to... Uh, not foreground this informal sector, informal identity as the prime identity of the of workers, because uh, it has, uh, in our obsession with the inform, we have failed to see actual uh, processes of class and social differentiation on the ground, and we have failed to see what women themselves have seen or women workers themselves have seen, and. Uh, I think I'll just end with that as right now, okay? Uh, these two slides were there for North India to give you some, I mean, you can use them as whatever. You can just, that's just data, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, that very insightful presentation and for uh, raising such important questions uh, in your presentation. So I think uh, we would keep the discussion going and we'd like to call- 
<laughs> yes, ma'am. We'll have Govin, ma'am, uh, after no, the discussion. I think uh, let uh, uh, Indrani, I would say that let discussion go first and then I will come. Is that okay? Okay. 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 I mean, I just <laughs> wondering. Okay. Yeah. I thought maybe you would uh, lost the connection. No, 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 no. I'm very much there. I, I just uh, un uh, not unmuted, but just uh, put the video <laughs> off so that the, the voice is very clear and everybody can hear. I'll no. put it back. Okay. How can I leave your presentation? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hmm. Right. So I will introduce our first discussant, uh, Professor Indra Munshi. Um, professor Munshi, she retired as professor and head of department of sociology, University of Mumbai. Currently, she is chairperson of the Institutional Review Board at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIS, Mumbai, and executive editor of Indian Journal of Secularism, IJS, Center for Study of Society and Secularism, Mumbai. Over to you, Professor Munshi. Thank you so much, Indrani. Uh, for a great deal and uh, I think raising questions which are extremely important, both in terms of uh, analysis and in terms of um, political, uh, what should I say, uh, political measures or political agendas. However, uh, as a sociologist, you know, what I think I do want to emphasize is are two things. One, Methodologically, I think it's extremely interesting here to see how two case studies actually disclose and reveal, and this is, I think, important for young researchers and students to see, that these are not just two case studies. You know, behind them are major systemic and uh, structural problems which is related to employment of, uh, of uh, the underprivileged classes, excluded classes, but women in particular. So these two cases have actually asked questions which any uh, sociologist uh, would ask, you know, where was she married and why was she married there? And why were 10 girls being taken to another place for labor? So, uh, so what I want to say is that for younger scholars, I think it's very important that you have started with two case studies and then really <laughs> gone very far with them into analyzing what is happening to the economy, which is in terms of, and politics of, let's say, working class, uh, including men, women, formal, informal sectors, so I think these were two very important uh, points. The one thing that I would of course like to say, and I don't think I'm adding very much here, I'm sure you, you uh, would have uh, implied it in your analysis and data is that while we see among the scheduled tribe women, you know, that their uh, participation in workforce uh, shows is going down. In fact, as I'm going to argue in my, uh, lecture next week, that in fact, the actual work has increased. Their actual work has increased very much. And the fact that they have now begun in the last, especially two or three decades, to migrate out of their village to towns, to cities, has really meant the kind of work which they, they do find very difficult to cope with, partly because the conditions are extremely harsh and partly because it is unfamiliar. <laughs> so uh, this is what, what I would like to say, but I also want to uh, just say one thing that when we talk about uh, mixed trade unions, which is, I mean, in most tribal areas, you don't see these kind of organizations. We have political organizations working who from issue to issue 
organize them, whether it is for forest rights or for wages or for you know employment. But this is not happening. You don't see big organizations like trade unions uh, really developing. And that is leaving women and men uh, in a state of complete vulnerability. I don't see that happening very much at all. And, uh, and it is also true that uh, forms of oppression not only remain, but have increased and uh, certainly sexual oppression and uh, harassment has increased very much in tribal areas. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there and uh, then go on to, maybe you want to go on to the next uh, discussion. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'd like to call our next discussant, Dr. Archana Sinha. She is head of the Department of Women's Studies at the Indian Social Institute, New Delhi. Oh, um, okay, I think. Connection. Okay. Uh, we can have. Yes, I will call them. Go in, ma'am, can continue. Okay. Um, did I? Yes, please, ma'am. Okay. So it is a pleasure always like hearing Indirani, where she talks with passion and with commitment and uh, analysis. Uh, so hardly we find many researchers uh, uh, with this kind of, of course, in women's studies you do find, but with the outside, this kind of uh, uh, analysis combining passion and um, analysis seems difficult, but it has been really the uh, uh, a, a good fit for the kind of listening to you in the running. Uh, in terms of your historical analysis, I very much was touched. We do talk of the plague and this and that, but what you brought out really, how the charges of sedition uh, on kind of policies uh, in the colonial administration and the so-called democratic administration after how many years of democracy, we are facing the same thing kind of, uh, uh, except that we are so many telaks now, uh, that is the that is the indication that you gave very much. Uh, that would be the, so that is uh, one thing was very uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, evident. Second was also about the uh, inequalities in access to infrastructure and resources that was there. Mm -hmm. That is, we have been uh, 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 talking about it, uh, but it became, uh, it's, it's a, like a mirror image and very kind of highlighted thing that um, um, emphasized these things come in, uh, in terms of the healthcare, uh, basic uh, common right, minimum rights, uh, increased care work during <coughs> pandemic period. So pandemic has added to this kind of thing. Not only it created adverse conditions, but it created adverse conditions, but also do our attention to these issues, which was somehow was getting a straight kind of thing or at getting lost at low level. So that was the, particularly with the kind of, um, uh, even in the discussions on the um, uh, in care work, but now what we saw that um, when the crisis hits and it happened uh, when I was in Bangkok in AIT in 2008 also, increased care work of women and surge in violence against women. I did not uh, come across any report in 2008 in Asian crisis, so much violence against women as it happened now. Maybe we became more kind of focused in understanding patriarchy or really the violence globally happened. And in India, of course, I mean, 30% France and China and various kind of gruesome violence uh, and domestic violence that happened against women. The so-called, so that only talks about the nature of the family, that the family that is uh, most of the women are living this kind of thing. So how the institution of the family has to be really seen. And I always repeatedly go back on the Engels analysis. When, uh, uh, when Engels says that family and state, these two institutions, uh, 
probably need to be reformed. He, of, uh, of course, talks of withering away, but it's not withering away. It is withering away under these conditions if it is not to be reformed. So that is one thing that uh, you, you pointed out. Of course, corporates, we don't receive any mercy from the corporates and we don't expect that. But we are going proceeding towards not only capitalism, but very junky capitalism that uh, and the best, most brutal form of capitalist kind of structure that we are going on. Uh, uh, on. But this, these capitalist forces are also really supported so much by patriarchy, patriarchal system. So we see the intertwining of the capitalism and patriarchy during this crisis. So that's why women's invisibility of the work, that's why this kind of um, uh, the two case study that you pointed out, how much they represent what is happening to, to these women. So that is, um, uh, that is very important in terms of um, uh, your presentation. Falling work participation rate and falling labor force for the how many years we have been discussing. I wrote a paper in about um, uh, 2013 oh, yeah. in ILO. Before that, I mean, it is seven years already. And before that also, it was the kind of thing. And when I was writing this, I told ILO, okay, what is new thing I am saying? I don't believe that women are in the schools and that's why they are not working. I can see in my own village where I was approached by women that they don't care for newly married girls. They said they wanted work. It's not really any kind of thing. The marriage will not be a problem. And that is the, that is the time I became aware of this. What is this really falling rate of unemployment means for women? And of course, that, that continued. And then all of a sudden, you, you realize that how situation has become worse. So Bihar and other things. So on the one hand, what does this data tell us? Data tell us that uh, entire lies to us, to our political economy, as a political economist, I, I would say that, that um, on the one hand, there is increased work of women, hmm? within home, outside home, outside they are desperate. <laughs> on the other hand, they are wherever the recognized work or the formal employment is there, women are not there, falling rate of women in the US and India. I was also reading this McKinsey report kind of thing, how it has women have lost globally. So it seems like um, North and South picture going together. And um, in SDGs, uh, where, the, where has been our concern, I, I think SDG commitment is also a part of the national policy. CEDA as part of the CEDA, as part of the human rights declaration. So SDG also we should look at that what kind of, you go to New York and Washington and you make these commitments, our state does that. And then you forget those things in the name of our cultural situation. So I look at the SDG. Mm -hmm. What does it mean that when we say that no one is left behind? Who is this no one? Are the indigenous people are there? Are the tribals are there? Are the STs are there? No, sorry, STs are there. And what is happening to them? All the data shows how they are kind of um, oppressed, beaten up day in and day out, <coughs> both women and men and women in particular. So these are the things that is really uh, bothering you brought out very well, how the inequities are growing up and what kind of uh, things are happening. However, there are a couple of things uh, that I wanted also to point out that how migration and war enter in the mainstream policy analysis now. That is important. One of the things, migration was, was limited to only some experts. Now everybody seems to be concerned. Everybody means every kind of thinking person seems to be concerned. This plight of the migration which people saw on the television and other things really made them realize that what has, how, how many migrants are there, what work they are doing, and what has been their condition and what, is, and what has been their neglect kind of thing in terms of data, in terms of their condition of work. And when they wanted to return their own homes, they were not given, they were treated as hostages kind of thing, on kind of without, any, without adequate food and uh, shelter resources. <coughs> Actualization of women's work and farm mobility also a kind of part of this ideology that I think that um, sexualization of women's work in farms is very much concerned, which have been subject of my interest uh, right from the beginning, that they are working day in and day out on the farms, but they don't have the right to resources. They are not considered farmers. So that <coughs> they are considered as dependents 
Uh, and like earlier before we had the movement for the franchise movement, and that time it was the women's struggle in Europe and other places that they wanted the right to vote and then the head of the household has the right to vote. Now we have the head of the household who are largely men and then they have the right to decide that what is what would be the resources and what they would be dictating the household. So this black box of the family or the household has to be really continuing concern for a couple of reasons. One would be the resourceless, powerless <laughs> condition of women. Second would be the, which are related to the macro level. This micro situation is related to the micro, micro level. And second would be the violence against women. Violence against women, not only in domestic place. It is in public sphere, in garment industry. I was uh, surprised to see how in the name of the supervision, how much violence takes place kind of thing. And also in public spheres. It is not only Hathras, it is not only Nirbhaya's case. I mean, so many things are happening that uh, hardly you will find a number of us who will not have not kind of faced this kind of violence at one point uh, in our lives, so, uh, particularly in a city like Delhi or some other places. So, uh, and if there is a violence, what is the role of the violence in the falling work participation rate of women? We need to really discuss this kind of thing. How many women, uh, there was some concern, little bit concerned when the number went down in the IT industry in the soon after Nirbhaya case. And after that, no analysis was done. And uh, that we need to do this further work. <coughs> the three Ds are very important, but in the, uh, as Indu and you, yourself point out, I agree with the kind of thing. But in this diversity and democracy at home, we also need to, in, the, the democracy need to be introduced in, in, in the household and in the community. There are the, we don't have this kind of democracy in the community, including in the Adivasi societies. Because I just completed, a, we completed a book, a, a co-authored book with uh, Devnathan on um, uh, witch hunts in India. And particularly in India, uh, took examples from Africa, a lot of, and what a cruel way of kind of uh, uh, torturing and killing women that is happening. So I think we need kind of something paying a lot more attention to patriarchy and masculinity attitudes. So in this situation is needed in order to improve the <coughs> gendered situation that we are in. Couple of points was other things of the, Increasing casualization of work, which you pointed out. Huh? And um, this increasing casualization of, I was recently reading on gig economy. And I was surprised to see gig economy is so much valorized now. That it is going to be the hmm, home-based work, flexible work, and women's participation would increase and women would turn into kind of dealing with the technology. But in the gig economy, same kind of um, base uh, disparity or disparity in the remuneration has continued in gendered condition of work has to continue, no decent working conditions and their concentration in the low paying jobs for payment for the same and similar jobs. So that kind of those conditions are prevailing. So we need to pay attention to this rise in gig economy also. So as, as you pointed out rightly, um, Indrani, that we have missed the bus. We have missed the bus a number of points. <laughs> and I don't call it missing the bus because it was not entirely our responsibility. It was the responsibility of the state, community, and all those people who were working on the kind of transforming our society, making as a democracy, a living democracy. <clears throat> so we need to pay attention to the nature of work in the gig economy and what kind of thing that would be. And the other area of work that I have been would be interested in really in improving working conditions is the increased care work. Hmm? How the increase, I have seen uh, people think that I, it is the kind of motherly nature of the work, a motherly sacrifice. I question all these things. I've seen, I was recently in the village about two months or uh, six weeks ago, and some women were grumbling outright because I come from that village saying that, oh, these boys have come, mother of three boys. And it is so much work. I don't know when they are going back. When do you think that uh, this kind of this thing is going to end? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the lockdown. So the, because there was so much demand, there was no sharing of the work and they were very tired of this kind of thing. And uh, so that, that we need to pay attention to these. Falling employment rates of women, um, of course, invisibility and uh, marginality of women in production boundaries is uh, of course a need, but not so called uh, uh, production boundary, like reproduction boundaries is also, and treat them as the production boundaries that also we need attention. I like SDG only for two reasons. <coughs> One is that women's care work, unpaid care work is to be recognized as work. If a woman is spent 14 hours a day in this work and she's not recognized as a worker, either by trade unions or by any other kind of progressive forces, then I think that we are, uh, the, we are in a serious problem. We need to uh, uh, set up that. And second reason is also that how the invisibility of their production work, the so-called productive work like agriculture and other kind of forms of organized work that is important. We, we will be missing out um, on another things. One is that we need to pay attention even the sensitization of the trade unions, except where women are trade union leaders, that I have seen in case of Bangladesh. I have not seen in Kerala, but Kerala has Kerala has uh, shown me a kind of dichotomy. And with regard, on the one hand, we see that there is a there was a human chain, okay, in uh, uh, in terms of as uh, when that uh, temple thing came. But the other thing was also how many women they also said that uh, we will not enter the kind of, uh, uh, it is it is a women's bodies is polluted and then would be the kind of, uh, that's why the entering the temple is not okay. And some women were feminist among them who were saying this. So, so that is, a, <coughs> now it doesn't mean that I'm denouncing these things because we all live in this kind of um, belief and not belief system. But what, what I need is that probably we need to look at these dichotomous situations and try to reveal that how the patriarchy has intervened, including, uh, including capturing or recapturing our uh, mindsets. That would be important thing. And lastly, I want, wanted to say that women's uh, unmediated right to resources has to be there, whether it is a commons property or it is individual property. Housing to... Um, um, uh, right to housing, right to land. I mean, I, I am not saying that everything has to be privatized, but wherever this has been privatized, women's unmediated share as individual has to be, have to kind of struggle for that and promote. Because in our good intentions to treat everything as the common property, when it is not a common property, whole of Maiga land has become really privatized land, which was a matrilineal estate. Our attempt should be to claim that share of women in this kind of, uh, that uh, that we need to have the policy uh, 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 policy interventions. Um, this is all thing I have taken notes of your kind of uh, great analysis, and I hope that your slides would be available for us. Thank you very much, Indirani. Um, thank you, Govind ma'am. Uh, Professor Mazumda, you can uh, respond to these comments and then we can have uh, another round of uh, comments and questions from other discussants. You said, Indra, regarding the fact that women are having to work much more huh? you, this uh, uh, in the current situation. I, I think that the picture is somewhat mixed on that. Because in, in, in our thinking and in our frame of analysis, we have for long held that in India, uh, uh, because, uh, they're, they're because of uh, poverty, absolute unemployment does not exist. You know, and in, in that sense, everybody tries to do something or the other to keep themselves going. And that's why we, we have very low unemployment rates in comparison to anywhere else in the world. But in my understanding uh, of uh, uh, in this period, and this I say particularly for rural areas where, where it is not considered, I believe that absolute unemployment 
has indeed entered our uh, system. It's camouflaged. It's actually camouflaged by, um, uh, for example, there's been an extraordinary decline in the number of cultivators. And mind you, that primary decline has been of yes. female cultivators and uh, an increase yes. in agricultural laborers. But in, in, in the increase in agricultural laborers, the increase is more amongst men than it is amongst uh, women. I mean, so in both se both segments, women are getting uh, pushed, uh, crowded out of there and displaced from, displaced from cultivation and crowded out of agricultural labor also in a certain sense. Of course, I mean, nothing is absolute. These are all broad yeah. trends that we can uh, see. But the, the, what I, I the, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that we are in a, situ, a new situation. We have predatory capitalism exactly. and markets penetrating into all spheres. Now, yeah. in that situation, uh, the, and this relates to some of the points that uh, Govind uh, was raising, what is happening in the family. Now, my understanding is, and I, I believe that, uh, I mean, there will always be exceptions. India is such a country that one, one trend in one area will be countered by another trend in another area. And there are immense amounts of variations on that. But broadly speaking, my understanding is that when women are being pushed out of the production boundary at a time when money is entering in a particular way, men are bringing in the money and women are not able to even add to the material uh, kitty of the household. All that she's left is with her capacity to work and uh, do people's bidding in a certain sense to even have her little place in that uh, mm. family. It's a very... Uh, uh, I mean, um, diff changing gender relations are changing. They are not, uh, they, there's a certain sort of flux that is in, in place. And there are several institutions also at work. Now schools, education, this, uh -huh. they are teaching. You see, yeah, I mean, you, it's nothing is sort of completely within itself. It's integrate, inter interconnected with a number of processes. And in all those processes, definitely certain gender ideologies are coming to, you know, sort of uh, become quite uh, influential and changing what existed. Even where, where women had certain rights, they are actually changing. And this you can see in tribal society. Sure. See, in that, I think the devaluation of women's sure. labor devaluation of the importance of women's knowledge because the local knowledge is no longer which they had mm -hmm. local knowledge access to the commons you know which developed in the city that is in the systems of learning are changing so that that whole in that whole process the woman's work her knowledge her abilities Everything is getting devalued, and this is one of the reasons why the fam getting restructured in a much more, you know, aggressively patriarchal uh, manner. You know, that's I feel that this is uh, this is a process. There will always be exceptions. There are loving husbands also, but I mean, let us look at the underpinnings of this uh, of the entire uh, process. So even if she is working more hours, what is she managing to do is a question. You know, that is the question. So, I mean, even when the, now the time use survey has come and some uh, information is there, I have not studied it in detail. I'm sure there will be many things that will come from that. But I still ask this question, what is she managing to do? Yeah. What is she actually managing to achieve with her work, with the number of hours that she is putting in? And yeah. that is, I think, the key question that we need to, um, that's why they, the, 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 I feel that that is the question that we need to focus on. 
and um, I, I, I personally think that uh, sometimes, you know, we find pathways which uh, for uh, on the road to equality and assertion, of, uh, female assertion, which are not necessarily, you know, found in an argument or debate. You know, it's not that we have discussed, uh, let's say, with the men folk that you would better change your attitude. Look, she's doing this, that, and the other. Sometimes the women are doing it themselves, and this is why I. I, I mentioned the trade unions and it's true. The trade unions have a very limited base. I'm not saying that they have a very big base, but they are, they are fighting. At this point, they are fighting. And, and you will be surprised to know, uh, uh, Indra, that uh, construction workers are very sizable proportion of trade union membership yes. today. Yeah, I believe so. They are yes. not, uh, uh, and if you look at the, the industries by which trade union membership is now uh, the thing, you'll see fine agriculture, and of course, that's largely plantation, so we know the thing. But I don't consider that because uh, plantation is uh, considered to be organized sector, that plantation labor is still facing the same kind of issues that and the same kind Absolutely. of. And including, including a certain segregation, exclusion, social yeah. exclusion. I mean, um, what is the word? Give me the word, <laughs> Indra. But you know, they are not integrated or they are not accepted I, I in the exclusion. In, in, yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah. I hate that word because it sort of uh, <laughs> yeah. signifies that you know that there is something in which people can just be included. I don't don't see that there. No. That's that's one thing, and I think Govind, you know, this is also related uh, to the fact that um, in a, when when I say that the women are doing it in the trade unions, they're not doing it because we said. Fact of the matter is, we are behind them. Yeah, they have moved. Mm -hmm. They have already moved, and we who are supposed to be uh, the anticipators and the analysts and this thing, we are actually behind them. For us, now it is a historical condition. We will look at it as having already occurred. It has not been uh, promoted in, I mean, some senses, broadly speaking, everybody has been arguing, but the women have done it themselves. Women workers have done it themselves. Yeah. And this needs to be acknowledged. And what happens is that that assertion that has grown also has an influence on their families because you know they have the way they have fought they have traveled long distances alone they have faced uh, various you know gobin yeah, yeah. 80 women used to come for a demonstration they would go back and be beaten up by their husbands no yeah. this was so uh, i mean it was a standard of yeah. sop if you know yeah. what i mean it was a so somehow there is a change taking place in all this, yeah. both in terms of uh, sure. aspirations. And here, let me say why I feel it's important for us to recognize these organized collectives, because the entire force of capitalist uh, development and its ideology is, is directed at splintering and atomizing uh, the responses. And that is ensures that uh, capital remains the only game in town. Mm. It's not the only actor on the world historical stage. Mm. There is a fight also. There are others and they also have to respond. And that is where this, uh, these elements, this, for example, if women are asserting themselves in the trade union, okay, the old patriarchs in the trade unions are also learning a lesson but the families are also learning a lesson in the process, sure. in the process. Mm -hmm. And so this, I believe, is the way forward today. And uh, particularly in the conditions that we have. And why I say this in, informal sector. You see, I'm saying, for example, I ask you, Govin, why is Seva not considered the vehicle for these workers? Because Seva look, is looking at women only as uh, uh, entrepreneurs and sort of looking at the informal sector. And it 
thought in the 90s, it even came to the conclusion that liberalization for the poor was their way forward. On the policy front, they took, it's not reflecting the needs of these, these women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their whole perspective and the way the informal sector discourse has uh, moved does not reflect the interests of even informal workers. It does not reflect the interests of the construction workers. Mm -hmm. It's not reflecting it, yeah. but intellectuals and in our community, this is the big thing, informal sector workers, unorganized sector workers, as if they're a separate category, they're not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is the point, you know, so, uh, and women are teaching us this. We should learn. Mm -hmm. The women are they teaching They are the workers. That is yes, the they are teaching us. So we should learn why they are doing this, why, I mean, I'm just saying that we apply our minds to this. Of course, you know, everything is a drop in the ocean, you know, Govind. Yeah, the signs are there for us. And uh, I, I uh, believe that in, at this time, it's important for us to identify the key issues and the key questions so that this these elements can move together towards uh, building a larger equality agenda on all fronts. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't happen on this all simultaneously, but it moves in that direction. Yeah, that's right. So that was my real uh, uh, point that I really wanted to make. Uh, yes. Thank you. Indra. That was really, there are some questions. Would you like to address them? Uh, Anshula, can you read them or uh, you can? Um, so uh, I think we'll just, uh, uh, go to some more comments and then we'll take the questions from the chat and Q&A. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay? Yes, ma'am. So we have um, Dr. Simi Mehta. She is CEO and Editorial Director of IMPRI. And then we also have Dr. Arjun Kumar. He is Director of IMPRI. Okay. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. yes, thank you so much. Uh, Professor uh, Mazumdar, thank you so much uh, for your uh, enlightening lecture. And uh, Professor Kelkar and uh, Professor Indra, your uh, uh, additions were just totally uh, very, very informative. Thank you so much. And the discussion, I was totally enjoying the discussion as well that you were just now having. Uh, so uh, I have um, a few thoughts, which I thought that I would like to put it across and maybe get your perspectives as well. Uh, so uh, when you talk about patriarchy, I feel that patriarchy is just like colonialism, which is very deep rooted and it is embedded in the society. And uh, when we are talking about gender and migration, um, uh, so the whole narrative of uh, young female folks who either wish to go out um, of their homes or move out of their homes to uh, for education or even for employment um, is is needed to be studied because it is sad that um, men who wish to do the same thing they are considered to be career oriented uh, but for women they are called various names like too ambitious or uh, even um, uh, you know lacking character etc. Uh, it actually is, on the other hand, it is okay that when uh, they actually join their spouses uh, when moving out, either inside the country or outside the country. And then uh, <laughs> simultaneously, it is another uh, sad aspect that even the middle and upper middle class families uh, tend to have their girls protected, you know, uh, by not allowing them or even not even encouraging them to uh, move out, even if they wish to, uh, to gain some exposure or experiences. This actually creates some sort of a caged mentality. And this baggage is so burdensome and it makes a ground actually for continued dependency of women upon men. And then uh, you spoke about loving husbands. So uh, I don't understand. I mean, uh, okay, love and compatibility is both uh, both ways. And then there are relationships, etc. issues. So, but there are women, uh, even young girls who are newly married, etc. Uh, they say that I am really lucky that my in-laws or in my or my husbands husband, uh, sorry, uh, they they allow me to work or they are they have allowed me to pursue higher studies. But it is is it a real is it really a matter of luck 
uh, isn't it her actual right if she wants to do do the same thing or so the same thing because the husband would never say that i am lucky that my wife is allowing me to study or uh, pursue you know uh, my career abroad etc so how do we actually uh, brainstorm to bring out bring some change in this lingo uh, in this uh, language of uh, dependency uh this is actually very disturbing for me and if you could offer your insights thank you so much again i really learned a lot ma'am thank you thank you simi i think uh, let arjun also say and then probably we can uh, arjun yes 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 thank you ma'am i just have one question since we are discussing today on migration and employment that uh, uh, but since <clears throat> govind ma'am has already touched upon that question Uh, the, what uh, uh, Professor Indrani uh, earlier raised that we have missed that the employment bus in all the elections which we see coming or in the recent past whatever has done we always say employment is the biggest issue rojgar 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 and everything and uh, it always gets you know a, a, a back seat so uh, really that <clears throat> political question doesn't arise or that. pressure but when we talk about uh, women employment and uh, that was from the last and last decade that is a very pertinent uh, uh, issue uh, why is there no uh, any visible impact uh, in in this field we has ma'am ma'am really touched upon that we had skill india shgs narega and so many schemes but really not that effective ma'am how do you see what other countries have done or any best practices here in india uh, how to strengthen more of women empowerment uh, in our nation building and uh, contribution to society just that how do we catch the bus again that was one very question i wanted to ask yes thank you ma'am govind should i respond please go ahead ha yeah or anshula would you like to add all the questions that will be great yeah yes. so i will just yes. we have uh, three or four questions uh, so one question is um domestic violence while working from home mixed with online cyber crime and trolling is multiple whammy what policies can workplaces provide for gig for gig economy for women is it uh, is it that they just leave it to women to bear the burden of violence at home that is one question another is um uh, are we are aren't we too much focused on the fact that poor women are vulnerable and ignoring the plight of economically independent women and another question is uh, men leave their homes and move to cities for work women are left behind to take care of children in laws agricultural land if any and at last of themselves men visit once a year this is a pattern women have accepted this as the norm is there a way out many women are abandoned in this manner we need to agree that the situation is extremely pathetic these are two or three questions that have come up here some questions on whatsapp also uh, facebook on also. facebook facebook um, on facebook uh, yes there is yes there is one question on facebook um so there is one comment saying lack of rural employment is causing the migration towards urban areas and economic empowerment is not working in the right direction and um one question is are they forming into shgs linking to the same trade unions um that is a comment and a question on facebook live so thank you so indrani would you like to take up these subjects not audible yeah it it works it works yes Haan, now it's yeah. mm. is a question and i think it is uh, also in some senses echoed by um, i mean amplified by some of the questions that have come on the facebook um you see uh, see me the obviously i mean we are living in a society where uh, uh, women's equality is not the dominant ideology you You, this is our society the question is how do we change it how do we establish it how do how are we because as i said right at the beginning if you do not address various other questions the question of the right to equality or the right right to be free of this discrimination that you are referring to where your see 
that remains just words. If I I personally don't believe that if we have a, that it's a problem of lack of awareness that if we just sensitize people, if we just sensitize uh, men folk, if we sensitize uh, various people, that we will get it. We won't. This is our history, and uh, for that with every advance we have seen that there's also a push backwards. You get a right to, edu you enter education and then you have a problem, you're pushed back in another sphere. This is how history moves. And it's important for us to recognize that in order to change that, we have to become, uh, 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 I mean, our, uh, approach towards equality has to acquire a critical mass in society. If it doesn't have critical mass in society, maybe in one, that's what I said, maybe in one individual family, there may be somebody who is uh, actually uh, uh, not so horribly, you know, discriminatory and uh, say, or maybe they actually change through uh, a certain amount of engagement and discussion, maybe. But it's not going to make a difference to the social order. And your majority of your women, middle class, non-middle class, working class, peasant, they are faced with this inequality. They are living in that. It's a live relationship. In, in, in its live existence, laws have help in some senses but we have to change the basic foundations of that society. And let me say one thing. You see, for you, you I mean, I, uh, Simi, it was very good that you pointed this out, that uh, when a woman goes out to work, they'll say Ke, uh, either she's too ambitious or she's uh, kar rahi hai, or she's, you know, sexually, whatever. You know what I mean? This is what I'm referring to. This is what I said. You see, this is the, I mean, actually, this is the way in which uh, village mentality, local, or, and often earlier feudal system, gets reflected in an entire uh, new uh, uh, scenario also. It, it, it gets reflected in urban areas also. When I presented, if you remember, I said, when women go for migrate for work, then they'll say it's trafficking, it's for sex work, it's for this, you know, that's, that's the way it is addressed, even in policy, even in policy. And then they send all their informers chasing these young girls. And you know, most of the cases in traf against tra uh, on trafficking, do you know what they are? They're elopements. The girls run away with somebody and then uh, uh, a, a case of trafficking is registered. This is the way in which you have a, a so-called paraphernalia of equality in law and so on and so forth. And on the ground, it actually works along the lines of uh, existing. So the answer to that, I mean, I don't want to sound, make you at all depressed because there's a lot of hope. The fact that you are asking this question, it's not just you. You see that this is happening in the university system. You have seen where as, as women have acquired critical mass in the higher in higher education, they have also started asserting themselves. They have. Now it's a process. It's a process of social movement and social change. It's not going to be uh, settled by you and I agreeing on, you know, this is, I've, uh, <laughs> this is going to happen. It's not going to, it has to come with this collective social movement. And it doesn't always, be, it isn't always that you uh, win your argument. You can win every argument. It'll make no difference. Look at our political situation. You think people are winning uh, or uh, in power because of the superiority of their arguments? No, they're in power because of power. You understand, this is power. This is how power works. And it's for us to understand what are the sources of that power. And so therefore, yes, this discrimination, every girl and young uh, feels it. Why I also have equal rights. Fact is you have equal rights in name. On the ground in this thing, 
people are not, uh, see, you can assert it. You have to assert it. Assert it like everybody else. That is, of course, there. But that's at an individual level. In order to make it something more, you see, you have to look at who can be your main force, who can be the instruments of pushing it. That's what I say. And have to look at the mass. And there you have to address majority. You have to address who are the majority. And definitely in this, the working women, the rural women and uh, sing, are, have a role to play. You can't be free, my dear, unless they are also uh, uh, in the freedom movement. Okay, <laughs> if you understand. So that's why I'm saying we need to have that. So our analysis has to be towards understanding what are the trends and what is it that can be uh, pushed on that. Of course, you will have all the other arguments on the question of law and uh, on the question of within the family, what is happening, those arguments and those discussions and those changes, and you have to push your way, you have to force some acceptance, all that will go on. That will go on and it should go on. Okay, that's it. Now, Arjun raised a similar question in relation to the macro situation. What you have referred to at the micro level he has brought the same question on the macro level. It, who is in power? And then I don't, don't mean refer to a party. Which are the classes and rulers with, who are running our system today, Arjun? In order to change that, I, I mean, I have personally, I've always been very critical of the way this empowerment model has been promoted. You know, women emerged as a development constituency in the 1980s. Suddenly, when, um, see, and the idea was you could, the government could spend less, pay less, and the women would do more work. So all the various schemes that you see, this thing, now we, women also took advantage, it was necessary. But I'm saying in that development of that constituency, the model of this individual empowerment of women or the empowerment of small collectives, very small collectives in a larger system, um, it, it replaced the word liberation in the, in the, in the language of uh, women's uh, movements and women's uh, aspirations. Empowerment was the substitute for liberation because then you don't have to look at the whole system. You look at only one aspect, you will be given some uh, investment, you will start some little chutney or some achar or some business, uh, some business and you will see. But the market forces today, and this Arjun is, applies to yours also, your question, issue also, the market forces are such that the small businesses are not surviving. I mean, you have a demand uh, issue, you have uh, big scale, uh, cheaper production systems competing, you have an open market where you have cheaper goods coming from all over the world. I mean, it, it, that's your situation. In that you will struggle to survive in some small way for some time, but you have to over a period of time think in terms of changing this, looking for an alternative development paradigm. I think that is what is absolutely uh, essential because uh, this model is not uh, empowering us. Maybe a few, whatever, what is it, her name, Indira Nui or whatever, some woman will become some CEO somewhere, including you, Simi, you're the CEO, is it not? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> you're the CEO, but I'm just saying, okay. You are I, the prince. <laughs> but you understand, you understand what I mean. I yes. see. Govind Nam is also CEO. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, Indira Ma'am oh, wants to join. Oh, can I? Uh, can I? Can I just um, please uh, join I, in? Uh, yes. Okay. Can we? Uh, can we allow uh, her uh, to finish? Can we allow Indira to finish and then you join? The, no, no, I don't know. We can let's have a thing because otherwise. No, I no. Indira, me, please finish. I'm sorry. I thought you you had. Uh, huh. Finish with that I, I can't recall this. the Yo. Facebook uh, questions, all of them, but this point okay. about uh, the, the fact that the gig economy, this gig economy. Yeah, question. that's all the question. Ah, yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, let me say 
that the entire process of uh, organization of the so-called gig economy is to mask the actual employment relationship and so transfer all elements of risk in uh, a, a onto the worker rather than the uh, establishment which is hiring them and the gig economy uh, i mean as govin pointed out uh, um, um, the women have, are are generally in any case stuck in the lower end of that uh, economy and of course the same uh, uh, divisions uh, um, that operate in society also uh, get reflected here in uh, they also have the double burden they have to still do various other work at home and do all this and they face um, uh, various forms of violence cyber trolling as somebody uh, 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 pointed out but the main thing is um, you must under, I, I, i mean what i find as uh, uh, what do you call it uh, 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 an intellectual and uh, statistical assault on uh, workers rights and on the on the conception of worker is now coming even in the statistics i don't know govin whether you know that they have now introduced a new category called dependent contractor you see they say they want to say that they are not workers they are all contractors so your home based worker your bd worker is according to the new uh, international classification of statistics icsc mm -hmm. uh, 2018 is mm -hmm. going to be uh, defined as a dependent contractor you don't did you know this this no. is now uh, missing and the americans have argued for this because the americans don't like the definition of workers they want everybody is a contractor so you know Mm -hmm. for years the informal workforce has been arguing that we have and we are employed we are given this thing we are given piece rated wages we are doing this we are doing that and uh, we need we need better wages we need all these issues there they are saying no you're an independent you're a contractor you may be dependent but you're a contractor you're not a worker mm -hmm. the same thing is done for middle class types of occupations in order to segregate now this let me tell you the labor codes labor codes that have been introduced mm -hmm. did you know you have one code for occupational safety health and working conditions code on that there's one code and did you know that sexual harassment or prevention of sexual harassment finds no yeah. reference in that code yeah. mm -hmm. it remains a separate law mm -hmm. because they are arguing you are a woman first you are not a worker so you i mean if you are asking for safe working conditions then you have to ask it of the women and ministry of women and child development not of your uh, employer in the um, uh, and your workplace you see you have a law for sexual harassment in the workplace but it's not considered a workers legislation you don't have an identity as a worker you are mainly this and they in this subtle way they want to continuously use hierarchies and sexual and uh, divisions by sex and gender and so on and so forth to prevent uh, a certain coalescence of interests so uh, i mean i believe that you will see that the gig workers will be organizing and they are already organizing and they are demanding it in a different way so your your delivery boy also is also a gig worker your uh, work from home yeah, what is this amazon mechanical turk ke jo employees hoti hai this platform economy they are also like that and this uh, ilo has brought out a very good study mm -hmm. and uh, on on this and you can get all the details of what happens It's, there's no quick solution we we have to change a lot of things that is what all that i'm saying and workers and employees and different sections will be articulating we have to back them we have to support them and that's the way we can move thank you i don't know whether it answered all the other yeah, questions you did thank you ma'am but i am not i'm not god and no none of us are gods that we will just decide and thump something we okay this is the rambal this is going to settle all the problems indira we have to fight that's all.
settled very little. Anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, two things, uh, Indrani. Uh, in fact, I am responding to uh, Sibi. Sibi, I think, uh, related to what you were saying, you know, when one talks about a system, when one talks about systemic change, this is precisely what we are saying, that society is not divided in independent parts. It's neither economy, polity, cultural, social, belief system, ideologies. You know, when we are talking about a system, we are talking about the interdependence of these parts which go on to make us. Okay, Marx believed that it was the economic infrastructure or base that was primary, which influenced everything else. We may agree or disagree with that. I mean, others have their own uh, dynamics and others, uh, I mean, you don't see a, such a close correlation between them. But you still have to talk about the system as a whole, which can only allow for just that much and no more. And patriarchy is very much a part of that. A capitalist system, you said it's like colonialism, it's older than colonialism. It's even older than colonialism. Now, point number two I want to make is as far as gender issues are concerned, it is, I think, at two levels. And anthropologists have lot, done a lot of work to show where, for example, the subordination of women came as far as the material activity was concerned. And there may be differences on that, however. So there is inequality that develops there. But I think we also have to remember that other institutions which are very vital to society, they develop an ideology which becomes the dominant ideology and enjoy a hegemony which is then further perpetrated through these institutions, whether it is school or religious institutions or family. And as Govind said, you know, family was quite important. And then the hegemony is so great that even those who are oppressed accept that ideological structure which justifies that <clears throat> oppression. That is a total internalization where women themselves say that, uh, you know, well, I'm lucky that they are allowing me. And women believe in many, even emancipated women. Somewhere there is a subscription to the dominant uh, ideology, which may be patriarchal and so on. The third point I would like to make is, and Indrani made, I, I uh, would, that I, I differ from Indrani is, that there is a lot of work coming out on uh, protest movements, resistance, social movement, which is actually showing us that other areas than the, let's say, the more conventional ones, say working class, or later on in China, as we saw peasantry, there are other areas, so to say democratic spaces, which are opening up, which are taking up issues which were not part of the old conventional resistance uh, politics or struggle politics. And here you do see sections which would otherwise, you know, keep apart sections coming together, genders coming together, and asking for certain kind of changes, whether it is law or mentality, so to say. Uh, I think all this is uh, happening. And as Rani, you had said earlier, that, you know, it is a kind of flux that is, that is 
very rapidly happening with uh, forces of exploitation and oppression in this large privatized globalized world that is happening but also there are other processes countering it which are new in character the, the small spaces where people come people meet people go and uh, i forget the name of the scholar who actually says you know democratic spaces come into existence and then may dissolve having raised an issue having asked for something and then we may go they're not stable structures they're not stable organizations anyway i i just wanted to uh, uh, indicate these can i say indra that i don't uh, you are not disagreeing i don't disagree with what you have said at all <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Uh, um, no, ma'am. There are no other questions. But if we could then have concluding remarks from you, and then finally from Professor Indrani Mazumdar. So I want. I can in conclusion, I can say that uh, few ideas share with few ideas that I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Hmm. But uh, besides uh, enjoying it highly, I also thought that uh, uh, the question was. Who? What is a loving husband? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I stuck with that, you know. Having uh, said really it, <laughs> is right. Love also has a material base in the run, in my yeah, analysis. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. Huh? So can... no matter yes, how yes. much the husband loves you, but if you don't kind of maintain the house, if you don't kind of uh, a, a kind of thing. Uh, uh, no, even if he doesn't require the kind of worst kind of services. then he think that okay you treat uh, his family as the family don't have much contact with kind of uh, things so all these kind of norms so best kind of thing the loving husband would be one who really shares resources and work and here i mean work and the housework and the unpaid care work that is that whether children elderly that is the one criteria of a loving husband second indicator of a loving husband would be the uh, the sharing of the resources whether the law provides it or does not provide even then he can which kind of thing now if we have this kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, husbands i would call them as loving and feminist husbands okay that is would my my definition of the loving husband but good term because a lot of people say i have nothing to do because i am a loving husband okay all husbands are loving but behind that love what is there that would be the and women are very loving wives huh? but they grumble also they say that i don't have any right and that uh, even loving mothers i would say so this is the kind of kind of human existence in which we have to share the burden and we have to share the whatever the entitlements are there that would be the one thing <laughs> on a serious note second is what the kind of um, when uh, question of trade union and question of i treat it as a kind of collectivity when women have the collectivity either as a trade union or as a kind of mahila samakhya or as the sg self help groups i think women's strength has to be seen and uh, that is the they, i i i have noted in many uh, times in uh, self help groups in uttar pradesh which is the worst kind of state but unfortunately i come from there okay so uh, mm. that uh, these self help groups really are women have become very empowered huh? particularly yeah. relating to other women sharing and andhra pradesh i have the stories kind of thing and telangana where even women decide in their collectivity to uh, to treat the uh, not treat but to beat the husband together so that the uh, they ask him first that to behave better and not to be awful to yeah. the wife so not to be oppressive to the wife and when he doesn't listen then they ask an elderly woman to start the beating so the man says oh my meri chachi ne peeta tha huh? it is when my but chachi is encouraged by them to raise the first hand and then they will beat up and man after that has stopped beating now the question is so these are the good practices i would say not in terms of beating the men not good practice in that but in terms of addressing the issue in uh, finding in the self help groups besides trade unions that's i was thinking 
and I wish the trade union women were more kind of concerned. But gradual, there is. I agree with the Indrani that there is a gradual kind of uh, um, uh, awareness uh, about uh, patriarchy, about uh, capitalism, and I I see them intertwining of capital capitalism and patriarchy because I also see many traditional roots in our social norms and our cultures. Uh, uh, so satis, witch hunts. I mean, I've been uh, kind of studying these kind of social norms, and uh, uh, they have been, they have been made more brutal, worse kind of thing in the capitalist economy. But I do find these traditional roots in feudal feudal system. So feudal system, when it turns into capitalist system, how how violent it becomes that we all know about it. But patriarchy is to be seen. It has the roots right there, and that social norms need to be addressed. If we are looking for a good practice, uh, Arjun, we have to see how these social norms have been defied by women. And there are cases where women, including in Bundelkhand region, Pink Sari <laughs> Brigade, that is, these are really how women have defied these social norms for women, for themselves as well for others. So they are not really individualistic women in any case, and that would be the thing. My last point would be, uh, these are the takeaway points for me. The gig economy. Gig economy is really scares me in the sense of it will lose the personal touch. It will atomize people further, women, men. But those who are powerful position, they become more powerful in terms of men being more powerful in this system if you don't relate to others. So relating in person and relating on computers, there are two different things. No, that we know. So that would be the kind of, but gig workers, there are examples from California that Uber in particular, that uh, they have got the labor rights now, limited rights, but nevertheless, they got the rights. So uh, as Indrani rightly pointed out that gig workers would form, whether women or men, would form this kind of uh, um, unions whether they call themselves trade unions or not, but they, they will form their unions to demand their labor rights. Because if the situation is so bad, so oppressive, people are bound to rise again. I strongly believe, in, as Indra has pointed out, in Chinese example, while looking at the good practice. And in terms of when Mao led the revolution uh, and uh, gave uh, land rights to peasant workers, his concern was, no revolution can be carried out on hungry stomach, okay? So this is the question of economic dependency of women. Dependency and particularly economic dependency of women, which Simi has pointed out. Where every woman raises this question, we think that women are supporting this. We uh, tend to sometimes get frustrated and so nothing can be done. But how do we really see that I don't have the house, a woman doesn't have the house, okay, in her name? She doesn't, she can't go to parental home because she would not be welcome. She would be turned, no, this is not your home, you go back. Where does she go? She doesn't have the capability <coughs> to work. So the question becomes that, okay, it is better to get beaten up some time, please one master, not to distress the system, and then live in kind of in a projected image of that, okay, I am all right. Many middle class women, there was a concern of, uh, there was a question about the middle class women. Many middle class women and lower middle class women face this kind of problem. You don't have, and that's why the material rights, whether in the relation of love or outside for dependency, making feel independent is very, very important. That would be the, these are my some takeaway notes. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we look forward to more discussions like this. Thank you, Indrani. Thank you, everybody. And now a vote of thanks, who would, uh, Arjun or somebody? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Professor Indrani, if you would like to conclude. Govind ma'am has really put everything in so much of perspective. Yes, I think Govind has concluded the discussion. I just want to say thank you to all of you. And I'd I really would like to thank these young women who are asking all these questions. And it is a great hope for uh, social change that they are asking these questions and uh, uh, I mean, sort of asserting, asserting themselves and questioning the uh, existing values and questioning all things. And I think that's uh, an enormous hope for the, for, for the future. And uh, <laughs> I 
I just want to say that I was only using that loving husband in a very light way. I'm now stuck with it. <laughs> Everybody is on it. <laughs> it was all I was saying it in relation to uh, violence. And I also understand that even loving husbands can be extraordinarily violent also. Because love can be violent also. But that's not, I was only saying that some people, some husbands may support out of love, out of uh, affection, out of anything, out of kindness, out of uh, uh, belief, uh, out of rational belief also. <laughs> but if they, if, if some of them do all the work also, Govind, and then they say, you are not doing it properly. And they say, you are not doing it properly. You know, so they can also be oppressive. <laughs> so but it, it, it is also all right to have a loving husband. It's all right. That's my point, you know. That's the, I mean, that was all that I was. I was it's all right to have a loving husband. If not, I, this has become husband. the key question in our discussion. No, 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 no. <laughs> But I, I really appreciate all the questions that the young girls have, and uh, Arjun also have put. But there's an urge. I think there's an urge. I think we need to all work together. Yeah. That's it. Right, right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, yes. Impri, also. Anshula, yes. Word of thanks, formally, yes. Thank you. Anshula, inaudible, inaudible. I'm yeah. inaudible now. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I would just like to formally thank uh, Professor Indrani Mazumdar for uh, a very enlightening talk today under the shadow of a pandemic, gender employment and migration in 21st century India. Thank you, ma'am, for taking out the time to deliver this talk. Um, thank you to our chair, Professor Govind Kilkar, for enriching the discussion, as always, with her inputs. And our discussant, Prof uh, Professor Indra Munchi, for taking out the time to participate today. Um, thank you to the IMPRI team, uh, GenDev Center for Research and Innovation and <laughs> Delhi Post. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today to watch here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and raised such important questions. And uh, thank you if you're watching later on YouTube. I hope you tune in for our future episodes of Gender Gaps. Uh, and yeah, have a very good evening. We really got to the soul of the issue under the shadow of pandemic. <laughs> yes. Thank you so yes. very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so have much. A good night. Yes. Have a good bye, day. bye, Govind and Indra. Bye, bye Indra. <laughs> so long. Yeah. Bye, bye.